Good evening. I'm Danielle Knapp, the Makash Associate Curator and co-curator of our current exhibition, Keith Acapulco, uh, Vision of Nature, Vessel of Beauty, on view in the Barker Gallery through the end of this month. And thank you for joining us tonight for Design for Living, Morris Graves in the Lake. Um, as you likely already know, our dear friend Keith passed away February 24th, and he is deeply missed. And today would have been his 84th birthday, if you were still with us. So I'm very pleased to be here today with all of you and who, like Keith, share an interest in Morris Graves. And you may already know what an influence Graves had on um, Keith's way of thinking about art early in his own career, um, as well as how transformative the experience that Keith had at the lake during his three-week artist residency in 2011 was for him. Um, and I hope that in celebration of Keith's life, you can take some time after Larry's talk tonight to also walk through his exhibition, whether it's the first time that you've been in the space, whether you've been back repeatedly while the show is on view. Um, you know, he would like you to walk slowly, look slowly at the work. So um, our speaker tonight, the JSMA's former curator of American and regional art, Lawrence Fong, has been retired for six years. Um, hard to believe, as we, we keep him uh, very busy with our requests, and he's a very valuable member of our museum family still. Um, as the co-editor with Vicki Halper of a book of Morris Graves' selected letters, and as a member of the Graves Foundation since 2012, Larry is an expert on this artist and such a, has such a depth of knowledge to share with us about what a special place the lake is. Um, but just as importantly, Larry was also a longtime friend of Keith's, and so... Uh, in addition to adding a dimension of understanding for us in experiencing Keith's show to learn about the lake tonight, um, we also know when we were inviting him to speak that this would be a lecture that Keith would have enjoyed. And so um, thank you, Larry, for presenting here tonight and for being here to tell us all about Graves Design for Living. Tech check. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. This is good? As Daniel mentioned, in many ways we were here, and I am here especially to celebrate the life and art of Keith Achapel. And uh, I went through the gallery this afternoon, and again I was struck and amazed by the passion in which he attacked this inspiration he felt after visiting the lake for the first time. And I remember him returning from the lake, and the lake is by Humboldt Bay, and we'll see some images of the lake. And he couldn't stop talking about painting. And he came in with a large portfolio of works on paper, and there was skunk cabbage. And uh, this skunk cabbage art from, as you see in the gallery, from early sprouts and, and fresh greens to just fragile decay. And he said, I've never been in a place where I could just gaze in one direction, key on one particular object, and imagine, if not experience, a life cycle. And he said, I have to go back. And um, I wasn't part of the Gray's Foundation at that point, but I knew the directors of the foundation, and I knew that I myself had been a resident, and that if you apply and are accepted once, you can't go back for, I think, four or five years. And I said, Keith, I'm sorry, but I think you won't be able to go back. And he looked at me, and I knew at that point that the rules were going to be broken that Keith was <laughs> going to be there. And I, I hope that he shared this with you or that Robert and Desiree Yarber, the directors of the foundation, shared with you. But everyone involved with Keith and, and the foundation were so impressed by just the energy and the vision that he could express on these paintings that were not yet even conceived. But he had in his eye and he had it in his mind, and he knew that at some point it would evolve into these paintings that Danielle has wonderfully organized and exhibited upstairs uh, into what we know of Keith in his art, in his life. 
in his vision. And um, so in honor of Keith, uh, I wish to speak briefly about Tamoris Graves, who was an inspiration to many artists, including Keith. At the time of Morris Gray's death in 2001, there were over 30 major monographs about his art. His art collection has been displayed and are in the collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum, the Corkin Gallery and Phillips Collection, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Detroit Institute of the Arts, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, any set of art museum, just to name a few. In Gray's time, these were the major museums repository for 20th century American artists, and Gray's was among them. Gray's major art galleries in his time were located in Seattle at the early Foster White Gallery, and in New York at the Willard Gallery, and later at the Schmidt Bingham Gallery. Today, he's represented in New York at the Roosevelt Gallery, which is in Soho, the Bracet Gallery in Seattle, and the White Lotus Gallery here in Eugene. The Stitcher Museum here holds the largest collection of works on paper by Morris Graves. In addition, it has important art from the collections of Virginia Hazeltine and Nancy Wilson Ross. Gray's personal papers consisting of letters, exhibit and gallery records, photographs, architectural drawings, notes, and ephemera are at this university's library and special collections. It's a magnificent collection, and we're privileged to have it here. In short, if one wishes to research the art and design, the life and times of Morris Gray's, you have to come here. From all the exhibit and gallery publications, only a few directly address Gray's architecture and design. A former curator at the Sarah Art Museum, Robert Johns, thesis was on his architecture. And more recently, Richard Fari, a long life friend and companion of Morris Graves, published book, His Art, His Gardens, is based on Fari's personal memories, notes, Letters About Gray's Designs was published. Tonight, I just wish to offer an introduction, an overview of his architecture and design, beginning with the earliest documented building known as The Rock, and ending with The Lake, Gray's last design for living. Here. Well known as a key figure in 20th century American painting, Morris Gray's livelihood was rooted in a lifelong interest in architecture, decorative arts and furniture, and gardening. His growing understanding and knowledge of these arts carried him through his best times and even his worst. He had a design for living, where and how to live, that evolved in complexity and scale. It became a more deeply embedded design at each of his residences, the rock, in Carolina, near Seattle, Woodtown Manor, near County Cork, Ireland, and lastly, the lake near Humboldt Bay, California. Graves was born in Fox Valley, Oregon, which is not too far from Salem. He was the fourth son of Edwin and Helen Graves. His father, Edwin, had persuaded his family and friends to homestead Fox Valley, and they built several structures there to live. But within a year, 
Graves almost died from pneumonia. Helen, his mother, moved the family back to Seattle. This is Morris to the left. The dapper dandy in the back, his older brother Philip. In the foreground, his two youngest siblings, first his brother Wallace, and then his sister Celia. Their livelihood in Seattle was, was somewhat remarkable, and there are letters upon letters about the experiences they had. Their father, Edwin, had a paint shop and was always building and constructing, and, and from time to time, uh, certainly Morris and his older brothers would be asked to help uh, lay a foundation, um, you know, begin structuring uh, walls and interior walls, exterior walls. Uh, but they're also, you know, very much of their community in, in Seattle. And uh, one of their near neighbors were the Nakashima family, Miriam and George Nakashima. And during the, during the war, during the internment, uh, certainly the Nakashima family, even though George Nakashima was a well-known and practiced architect and uh, engineer, um, the Gray's family took all their personal belongings and stored them from him and for the Nakashima family until after the war. And of course, those of you who know George Nakashima's designs and furniture, uh, George Nakashima ends up not going back to Seattle, but to New Hope and create an extraordinary legacy of unique furniture design. From 1927 to 1930, Graves visits China and Japan as a seaman. He travels with his older brother, Russell. These travels near and afar is significant in shaping his ideas of the world and an appreciation and understanding of his time. This is Graves in 1929 on the USS Taft. They actually had to lie about his age because he was too young to sail as a merchant seaman. And then one page of a letter to his mother, Helen, his letters were often illustrated. And this is about his first experiences in Shanghai on the Bund. And at the very bottom, his drawings of some of the architecture and some of the street scenes along Shanghai. He took many photographs. And we have several of his visits to Japanese gardens and temples, but certainly also these vernacular homes that he would visit time and time and again. In Japan, he's especially fascinated by residential architecture and certainly art materials, papers and brushes that he would use throughout his career. So at age 21, Graves has yet to finish high school. And his mother, Helen, like moving the family back from Fox Valley to Seattle, sends Morris to Beaumont, Texas to live with an aunt to finish his education. However, while living in Texas, Graves explored the South and ended up in New Orleans, where he met Willard Case, an antiquities dealer and an early patron. In a letter to his mother in 1931, he says, I fell into a conversation with Mr. Case and immediately employed my best vocabulary and knowledge. I talked about Sheffield. I talked about Chippendale. Later, he invited me to dinner and introduced me to artists and other craftsmen in the area. Willard Case is so impressed by Graves, his knowledge of decorative arts and furniture, but also as a painter, that he commissioned Graves to do several paintings. And this is a mural that he does for Case. And we have photographs of the murals. And in this collection, we have early drafts and early sketches of these long rectangular floral paintings that are gilded as well, or touches of elements of gilt along the floral edges that he did for murals for Willard Case. 
And you can see that Graves is picking up off, obviously of the environment and terrain that he, that he would experience, um, certainly in, in New Orleans. And it certainly is a subject that he never approached this way again when you see his paintings of fish or minnows or birds. During this period in his travels, Beaumont, Texas, he also paints in 1931 Brazilian Screamers. He says the subject is just foliage. It's vigorous. It's luxuriant tropical plants and two Brazilian Screamers. I'm not sure why they're screaming. They're realistic, not photographic. A certain power showing their existence in space. It feels like it's just not my work and that it surpasses my other work so far. It's almost uncanny. He returns to Seattle after finishing high school and briefly studied at the Cornish College of Art in Seattle. There he met modern dance choreographer Merce Cunningham, painter Mark Toby, composer John Cage, and others. And if you want to know more about Merce Cunningham, the choreographer, and John Cage, his lifelong partner and composer. There actually is a wonderful portrait in the Korean Art Gallery where um, there's a wonderful selection of contemporary Korean art. And it's by Nam Ju Pike, I believe. So he paints this still life, which is in the collection here at the museum uh, around 1932. And it's thick, it's kind of messy, it's not, you know, it's very unlike the previous painting, um, Brazilian Screamers, which was, was very, very fine lines and, and flat, you know, flat use of, of elements and materials. Uh, but he wanted to do this because it was to um, go into an auction uh, for funding the, um, the school, the School of Art in Seattle. Gray's earliest construction project was on Vidanka Island near Anacortes. Gray's named the site The Rock. He lived there from 1940 to 1947. The Detroit Institute of Arts director, William Valentiner, visited Gray's at The Rock and later wrote to his gallery dealer, Marion Willard, about his visit. Valentiner writes, the place where he lives is indescribably beautiful. The house is built, the house he built is perched on a rock like an eagle's nest. It makes one dizzy to look down into the valley 1,000 feet below. And he builds this for the most part on his own. And Grace had this really extraordinary ability to visit a site and understand what it would feed him in terms of what he required to be a creative artist. The interior of the rock. Valentino also writes that Gray's is crouching on the floor near his bed, and he's painting. He's painting on gold and silver papers. Obviously, these gold and silver papers are ones that he collected from Japan. He asked Graves what they were. Graves says, they're just notes. They're just messages. And from the earlier photograph, note the bay window. And then from the interior, light that would come onto the floor, which was his studio and the way it frames the landscape. While living at the rock, he paints Ego in the Rock in 1941. Leaving oils, canvas behind, he paints this one with gouache and tempera.
This is a detailed photograph of a works on paper by Grace that Grace sends to Valentina, and it's titled Message to Valentina. And when this was sent to the art museum to consider for the collection, the donor, uh, the daughter of Valentina, who happened to be uh, Brigida Bertoia, uh, the wife of Harry Bertoia, and she said, I'm not quite sure you want it because there are holes all over it and we could never understand uh, why my father kept it. And uh, it had no deep or intrinsic meaning for, for Brigida or Harry and so they thought we would enjoy having uh, this large collection of works on paper. And so when we received it here at the Art Museum, we looked very closely and we realized that those holes at one point had interwoven and, and uh, held mica flakes. And so there were flecks of mica that Grays meticulously removes throughout the paper with the exception of one and it's where this wonderful ray of white tempera intersects the plane and to the left, the very top, a fleck of mica. And it was one of those notes, one of those messages that he thought Valentina would understand. And obviously Valentina did, uh, but his, unfortunately his daughter, or fortunately for us, his daughter did not. So we have this piece in our collection. In Gray's personal papers here in special collections, there are hundreds and hundreds of little cards and notes that he made to himself. Uh, notations about on the above, uh, spatial relationship of, of, of columns for a portico, um, ideas about uh, dimensions and scale of the portico timbers to the plinths, and below, a chair. And uh, he was always hopeful that at one point he could design and fabricate a line of furniture. And he actually did a few when he lives later in Ireland. This is a pencil and a colored ink drawing, 1938, and it's titled Roman Nightfall. It's a series of paintings of different decorative designed European chairs. His, his knowledge of architecture and decorative arts is revealed and they're all titled English Nightfall, French Nightfall, Roman Nightfall and his, his commentary at this time in history on the decay from his perspective of Western civilization. This Nightfall series is included in the MoMA exhibit, Americans 1942, 18 artists from nine states. Over the next few years, the Museum of Modern Art would acquire 14 pairings by Morris Grays for their collection. This is a painting that's probably more familiar to those who read about Grays and his contribution to American art and uh, it's buried in moonlight and it's in our collection here and it was a gift to the museum from Nancy Wilson Ross, buried in moonlight. And both he and Toby were publicly acknowledged as, as sort of the, you know, the visionaries for this sort of white writing, this, this tempera uh, that, uh, that feeds into an overall kinetic composition of a bird with two heads. And then, of course, the moon, a source of, of energy, uh, if you need the composition. And for Graves, you know, everyone kept on asking, both Graves and Toby, uh, about the significance of this symbolism of the white writing. And they really never do address it because I don't think they, you know, felt that it had one particular meaning, one particular um, idea. Uh, for this painting, Gray said, it was, it was more of a molecular structure. 
he wanted a molecular structure that to him would resonate um, dispersal of, of light coming from the moon on the double-headed bird, one silent, one not. Nancy Wilson Ross is the singular person responsible for Gray's gallery success in New York at the Willard Gallery. So Nancy Wilson Ross, a graduate of the University of Oregon, becomes a very well-known, successful writer on Eastern religions and philosophy. Moves to New York, befriends Marion Willard, who shows at that time uh, modern artists from, from East Asia. And it was through Nancy Wilson Ross's suggestion that she come to Seattle and visit two artists that she knew. One was Morris Graves, the other Mark Toby. Another painting quite different that Graves did while at the Rock is Effort to Bloom. This painting is also in the collection here. And it's an extraordinary painting, again, my feeling distinctively taking advantage of what water-based materials would offer and, um, and the, the wonderful contrast using sort of something very opaque uh, like tempera, which is very fragile um, in, in the way it lays up on the surface of the paper. And it's, it's one of the more difficult things of, of having Gray's works on paper is the fragility of, of the mediums, uh, especially tempera. And um, in Effort to Bloom, again, it's, 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 a, it's a struggle. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a living organism um, in a frail state. And this came to us um, from Virginia Hazeltine, the other major patron of, of this art museum in relationship to its extraordinary collection of works by Morris Graves. And this is Nancy Wilson Ross. And I'm hoping maybe Ann Rose, you might know who the calligrapher is. <laughs> no, but I, you know, it, I, I was very impressed by this, by this, um, by this portrait, and, and certainly the fact that um, its setting is with a contemporary, uh, I believe, Japanese calligrapher. So the rock is one of those sites that's both sort of dramatic in terms of its precipice and looking 1,000 feet below, but also fields and fields of the type of tree growth you'd find in the Pacific Northwest. So he paints here, joyous young pine. So quite different than, than effort to bloom. And it is, it is an incredible statement of youth and joy. His growing interest in architecture is supported by sales of his paintings. Also, Marion Willard lends him money throughout their relationship. And he's very good at bartering for building materials for his construction projects, especially for heartwoods and exotic woods that he would need for his Dix residence near Edmonds. From 1947 to 1954, Graves lived at a house, studio, and garden. He designed with an architect, Bob Shields. He named this house Carolodden. So this is a rather romantic, fuzzy image of, of Woodway, the site. Um, but it gives you an idea of what appeals to, to Grace in terms of what he chooses or how he selects a place to live and to create. This is Grace during the construction of Caroladen. He moves 
huge boulders onto the site. And so his interest goes beyond structural design. He's also very much involved in landscape. Which often result in a setting like this. And these are all photographs he, that he took that we have in the papers here in Special Collections. Here's a glass pitcher that he places, I believe, on one of these large rock aggregates. And here a painting in the late 1950s titled Flowers. It's a tempera and watercolor on paper. Flowers were one of the great subjects of Graves' art. He felt some were just too literal, but often they evoked a sense of fragility and transcendence. He writes to Marion Willard in 1950, I will have many strange little flowers for a spring show. Would your gallery like to turn florist shop for a month? I kept a tight lid clamping them down, but it's no use. They're springing up like crazy. So he's in a flourish, like Keith. He's painting like crazy. I'll send you a whole nosegay. And he signs this from inner eye, the mystic Morris Graves, to inner nose in a few desperate years. <laughs> so he's somewhat not sure he should just paint flowers after bird in the moonlight and the eagle, the nesting eagle. It's another flower sketch he does. And this is also in the collection here. We're fortunate that a photographer, Mary Randlett from Tacoma, documented uh, the lives of not only Morris Graves and Mark Toby, uh, but many Northwest artists having lived in Seattle. Her mother, Betty Willis, assists Marion Willard in working with the Northwest artists. And so uh, when Betty would go out to meet these artists, she would bring her daughter along, Mary, and Mary would bring her camera. And so Mary has a wonderful doc document of, of artists of this period. So we have Mark Toby to the left, Marin Willard receding in the background, and Morris Graves at Carolina. And these are the heartwood timbers that he bartered with a mill not too far from Woodway, Woodway Edmonds, not, you know, just south and west of Seattle for his portico. And, and those of you who like wood, I mean, these are just gorgeous. I mean, and um, you, couldn't, you couldn't find these today. So during the project of, of researching and editing the books of letters, uh, Vicki Halper and I were able to visit a few of the sites. Uh, the rock no longer existed, but and the at that time owners of Carolotten invited us to come to visit. And so it's a present day photograph of of Carolotten. And this is the gatehouse. Before you enter the the grounds of the house, you pass through a gate. And it's the gatehouse where Grace had his gallery in his studio, not a gallery, but he had a studio. So he painted in the gatehouse. And one of the things that, that Graves, as a painter, always required was isolation and distance. Uh, no matter how magnificent or complex or large the building structures he was designing to live in, um, his studio was often either detached or remote or distance from the main livelihood of the house. This is an early photograph of the portico. 
And again, like the, the Forrest did a portrait of uh, Marin Willard and Mark Toby, um, the elaborate tableaus, the still life, everyday settings that Grays would create to have coffee, to have bread, uh, to read the newspaper, to do his correspondence um, is quite lovely. And then in 1949, when this photograph was taken, you could see here in the distance another table, another vase, yet to be adorned with flowers. That when we visit it, we realized it was, it was a painting. And so I've seen photographs of paintings he did on rock surfaces. And, and, and this is the first one I've seen that he actually did on, on a built structure. Uh, but um, he painted on, on several of the rock outcroppings at the rock um, near Fodaga Island. Late in living at Carolotton, Worth Grays writes to Victor Waddington. And Waddington has galleries in London and, and in Dublin. And he writes of Carolotton. Carolotton is kind of a sylvan forest. It's new, it's spacious, it's more elegant than I had thought. I have a studio, the workroom, it's a walled garden. But the fearful scream of jets and the awful mechanical drone of commercial planes made for yet another emotional cross current. Unfortunately, Carolodden and Edmonds would be in the flight path of Boeing aircraft. So during this period, he paints a series called Machine Age Noise. And uh, he's angry, he's anxious, uh, he's ready to to start anew once again. So this is Machine Age Noise, 1957, ink and tempera on paper. Living in Ireland from 1958 to 1964, He and Richard Sferri are looking for a stone house with a kitchen garden, a pond very near, sufficient acreage to assure privacy, unpretentious gate, very much like the gatehouse he had at Carolotten, but not too well kept. He doesn't want a gentleman's park. He'd rather have an old farmer's house in acreage. They find an 18th century manor near Dublin. They call it Woodtown. It's 18th century, it's 200 years old. It requires extensive renovation. At one point, there are 12 people working. They're excavating a new pond. They're building new terraces. They're laying foundations for new walls for another garden. The interior of the structures being fitted with new plaster walls, windows, doors everything. His companion, Richard Farley, writes to Morris's younger brother, Wallace, it's age, it's patina, it's a mood. 27 acres of meadows with a grove of ancient oak, twisted hawthorn hedges dividing the fields, raised by 14 shaggy sheep. It's 200 years of patina to work from. And instead of building we're unearthing, we're revealing. Richard Sfari to the left and his dear friend Jan Thompson, who Gray's met. Jan Thompson worked for Richard White at the Foster White Gallery in Seattle. So this is the grounds and the interior garden that's being worked on. Um,
almost to commemorate his experiences in Ireland, he, he paints this painting as well as others. It's titled Hero. It's been on exhibit here. Portrait of Irish Celtic Tepperbit, 1955. To Marion Willard Graves writes, this is a lightly brushed and considered detailed thing called Hero. It's an attempt at an Irish essence, a blend of physical adaptation and ego moving through the Irish world of sunshine and shadow. And, and little notes that I think are quite revealing, uh, not to forget the sort of mythical feat that may be on furniture, may be on another hero creature, we're not quite sure. He paints he these hedgerow animals that uh, he finds kind of nesting in these thickets of, of hawthorn. And this is quite free, um, showing his, his command and use of, of ink on wet paper, and uh, very absorbent, but uh, showing absolute control of a hedgerow animal in hibernation. Also in this collection, you'll see variants of, of this subject that are quite detailed, quite photographic, but showing his excellent draftsmanship, both with pencil, but also with uh, more fine um, painting mediums. Soon after finishing Woodtown, a NASA Art Advisory Committee invites Graves to visit Cape Canaveral. This is around 1964. And he witnesses the launching of a man into outer space. This inspires what he had begun, sculpture. First time he was working in sculpture with these materials for new navigation. They're titled New Navigation. It consumes the artist, it consumes Graves for several years. This new work, this sort of invitation uh, by NASA to, to bring him into the conceptual idea of, of expressing space through, through creative expression draws Graves back to the United States. Many of the materials that he he brought together and assembled, and a lot of the artisans that were used to assemble the early instruments for new navigations uh, were from Ireland. A lot of the materials were uh, collected in Ireland and also Italy and assembled at Woodtown. Moving back to the United States, Graves could live anywhere he chose to invest the energy, time, and finances. He considered New England, where he would be close to Marion Willard and Nancy Wilson Ross. He even explored the Willamette Valley. He considered Japan. He had extraordinary, wonderful experiences, inspirations from Japan and its culture. But he learned the type of property and the certain building materials that he would want would be challenging to acquire. But as he's traveling to Japan, and as he's traveling up and down the West Coast and through the Mountain Valley, he comes upon a site not far from Humboldt Bay, Lolita, California. I'm now at last buying a tract of land near Eureka, which is where I, build, I will build a studio and settle. Virgin forest surrounding a lake, the forest is magnificent old growth redwood and white fir and spruce and all the other Pacific forest plants I love to live with. The little lake is filled with miniature islands which grow miniature solo and blue huckleberry and dwarf spruce. When Gray's first invited Richard Farre, Alvin Friedman King, Jan Thompson to visit, they thought he was crazy. They had experienced and they'd helped him grow both as an artist and as a designer and as a builder. Um, the Rock, Carolina Woodway, Woodtown Manor, which is 
extraordinary. It was, Guitel Manor was, I think, eventually bought by an heir to um, Guinness, Guinness Brewery. Um, Kerr Laden, I believe, was just on the market two years ago, and I think it sold for $3.5 million. And they thought he was crazy. Who would want to live here? This is what it looked like. But for Graves and everything he required to design a life for himself as an artist. The main house to the left was built with the architect Ibsen Nelson, a Seattle architect. And to the right, a later addition that Gray's built and designed himself is his studio. It's 200 acres, or 200 plus acres. Uh, the lake itself is six acres. Um, it's a quite, quite large lake. Again, referring to his early experience with Japanese architecture, the little walkway as you walk under the overhanging eaves of the roof line in Japanese architecture, he recreates for the main house at the lake. The relationship of the siding of the residences to the landscape and to a cultivated design landscape is also something that never left the impression of Grace when he was working on the lake. To the left is this boggy ground. To the right is the construction of the main house, the Ibsen Nelson Morris Graves house. And it's from the south. And what we see as raw ground would be the formal gardens. And on the other side of the roof line and the tree line of the lake shore on the other end is the lake. But this was the problem. Ibsen Nelson writes to Morris Graves, you have poor soil conditions, and you have two choices. Move the house back onto solid ground farther away from the lake, or design a complicated pile-supported system of reinforced concrete structural supports to carry the house over boggy terrain. He chooses the latter. So when you visit the lake, what you have from about this point to the edge of the lake shore, horizontal concrete foundations that are tied to more firm ground up on the hillside on the berm and extending out onto the lake. And above these concrete foundations, and, and they're about 60 feet long, are timbers, are redwood timbers, 18 inches in diameter, that cross the concrete support structure upon which the foundation of the lake house is built. It's fascinating to go into a studio of an artist. You kind of get an idea of not only the materials they like to work with, but perhaps um, the environment like they work. Uh, some of these photographs were, were done later. I'm not quite sure if they were actively, Graves was actively working in the studio at this time, but um, this is the interior of the studio. And some of the paintings. He's now working with acrylic. And he's left the the challenge of, of working with, with water-based mediums and, and tempos and things like that. He's working with acrylic and his images and his floral compositions are lovely. They're, they're delicate, uh, but they're much different. They're not as immersive, I think, and, and not deeply embedded into uh, the papers like um, his other paintings. He also painted standing up and horizontally over a table. So he didn't paint vertically on an easel or on the wall. He painted like a calligrapher would, would draw and write. Uh, 
Also in his studio, you find a lot of his props. Uh, I, was, I was struck to find that he used uh, stencils for some of the vessels and even his iconic circular moon or sun. Um, he used blotting papers because early his work required a lot of blotting because he just immersed his papers into the mediums. Hundreds of, of brushes and as an as a artist resident at the lake, you're welcome to use what there are uh, in terms of his water, his water inks, um, his brushes, um, you know, his vessels and things like that, even his templates. Another image of the of the main house from the North Shore. And do you remember that first photograph of that bog? And uh, this is lovely, uh, but also it's um, intensive maintenance. And if you can imagine living in an environment of 300 acres and old growth, uh, surrounded by old growth and, and you know, the bird life of, of osprey and, and heron and eagles and things like that. And all the various seeds they could drop upon you that might be invasive. It's what, what the foundation is doing on the direction of Robert Yarr is, is nothing short of extraordinary to try to preserve Gray's vision in a place And not quite what, what Gray's had envisioned in terms of being able to look from the great room out of every window and experience beauty, because you do see the, the roof eaves and, and the roof line. Um, but it doesn't take you long, once you're in the great room, to find a special place where these vistas, not only from the great room, but from just about every room in that house, uh, experience a setting like this. Theodore Wolf, the Christian Science Monitor arts writer, an essayist for Gray's 1983 retrospective catalog, Vision of the Inner Eye, wrote to Gray's about his paintings. This is in 1981. You are a truth seeker and above all, an authentic voice. Your best works have the remarkability, your best works have the remarkable ability of being activated once they are within one's mind and within one's sensibility. Your birds, your trees, your vessels, your flowers may have begun life as yours, but as far as I'm concerned, they are now mine. This painting, April Flowering Cabbage, and a glimpse of continuing acrylic on paper. In 1996, the Seattle Art Museum organized the exhibit Morris Graves Flower Paintings with Theodore Wolf and Vicki Halper. This is a note he had clipped um, to correspondence and uh, to Nancy, Nancy Wilson Ross. And it reads, the mandate of the now, the mandate of the region, age, time, money. It also says, Nancy dear, have you not heard that we are now living in regions and not everywhere on earth at once? Then he says, hurrying on to change dimension via death. Since the late 1970s, Robert Yarmer has helped cultivate the lake, and after Gray's passing in 2001, he has shaped it into a retreat and artist residency. Gray's continuum, the lake, gardening, 
painting seen at this note is at the core of the present day mission of the Morris Graves Foundation. Thank you. So time for a few questions and then uh, I'm happy to um, go across the court and maybe go into the lounge and, and uh, have more informal casual conversation, but uh, questions? Yes, Henry. Oh, yes, I was interested in the gatehouse studio concept, which uh, was an integral part of uh, his earlier residences. And I wonder if he had dispensed with that feature by the time he built the lake. Is there a gatehouse studio sort of arrangement there? Or I mean, where, I mean, physically, where he placed the studios? Within, um, well, at the Rock, there was no choice. I mean, it was one room, and it's where he lived and where he painted. Um, at Carolodden, uh, he was very specific to put guest quarters uh, as far as away as possible to where he might be painting. Um, early he painted in the gatehouse, so was it even part of the main structure of the residence? Uh, at Woodtown, it's a separate building. And so you have the main house uh, with the great room, and then you have that cluttered small house, which is quite primitive. It's a wood stove, um, electric burners and uh, but it's just what he wanted it's just what he had to have does that answer your question well yes but by the time he got to the lake right that sort of uh, separate from distance from the main residence had sort of disappeared yeah. yes what, is there anything at the Rock now? I mean, what's, what's that like? I mean, his house was gone. We didn't go to the Rock, but um, I'm not quite this is a true story or not, uh, but at the time of his passing in 2001, uh, it, was, it was shared at a gathering um, at that time that the Rock structure had burnt and that there was a caretaker at the site and the caretaker reported that, unfortunately, the rock structure had burned. Yeah, so it's no one there. And so I think you have access to there. And um, interestingly, in, in special collection of the papers, you can actually find the actual property. And, uh, and so I, I think you could find it. And you certainly could find the house, uh, Care Lodd, in Edmonds and, and Woodway. In fact, I think if you, if you go online and you either Google Carolodden or Woodtown or Richard Ferrari's books, uh, it'll lead you to, I think I pass realtors listing of Carolodden. And, uh, and then certainly Gray's uh, last residence, the lake, uh, by invitation, certainly. And, um, Residence. I should talk about the residencies because it's early. It was open to visual artists and, and, and visual artists certainly nearby and close to the region of the lake were invited to apply. Uh, but today, writers, um, musicians, composers, uh, poets, painters uh, are invited to apply for residencies, and it's up to three weeks. Sure. Did he find uh, furniture that he liked, that he moved between residences? There's one lounge piece back that is an extent, and it happens to be in New York. And uh, it was fabricated in, in Ireland. And uh, so the owner was aware, I mean, a long, long, long time friend of, of Gray's. And, and, and when Gray's was moving back to the States, he, he asked to, to purchase it and brought it to his home in New York. So that exists. And then, um, and I, you know, then I'm, I'm terribly fascinated with the relationship with the Nakashima family and who visit from time to time. And, and so when you visit the lake and some of the other structures that they've built, you'll see these rough edge 
tables and things like that. And I say, this is a George Nakashima. Of course, they don't know. And um, some of the chairs and so forth look rather important. I mean, do you think he did? I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Do I, do I think he made them? No. I, I'm just wondering if 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 there were objects, you know, for instance. Um, that are seen in the photographs of the rock, um, right. either you know that he had found in the Seattle um, area, that he uh, um, became um, attached to and moved from residence to residence. I think some he he did. Um, I think the, there were bottles and things like right, that. Right, like like. Um, there's a three-legged chair from the Nakashima line titled Mira, named after his daughter. That chair was at Kerlaudan and comes to the lake. Um, you know, I don't know about others, uh, Sherwin, but certainly there were pieces to attach it. He was, I mean, you know, like the experiences when he was in Texas, he would go through, use furniture stores every step of the way. I mean, if he was hitchhiking from Seattle to LA, he'd probably visit every used furniture store along the way. And he would buy and sell and buy and sell, you know, to put gas in the truck that they were driving and things like that. And so, some of the chairs in the photographs did not look modern. They looked like objects that he found in stories. Right. And so, yeah. And so during his lifetime, especially. And, and honestly, I mean, the only house I've experienced that was lived in by graves up to the point when I was there, um, extraordinary objects from his travels to Egypt, to India, to East Asia, Japan and China, uh, throughout the United States, uh, you know, England, Great Britain, Ireland, and some were gifts. But, you know, also natural objects, you know, rocks and, and shells and, and you know things that that inspired him and that he, he felt some resonance to. Yes. Larry, does the lake or the surrounding 300 acres have any kind of financial support or regulatory support from the county or the state beyond what the North Carolina Foundation offers? Uh, <laughs> no, there isn't. I mean, certainly, there certainly because of of the nonprofit status, we you know we enjoy. Um, you know, a nonprofit tax status, and, and uh, I would say we're a poor foundation in that way because, as as much as the people in the local area, the region, they appreciate what exists there. There's not a lot of uh, opportunity for individuals to support uh, where. We're trying to address the preservation, certainly of the of the lake house, and it's built in 1965. You know, we're we're dealing with, I mean, fortunately, redwood siding, you know, uh, cedar timbers and things like that, uh, part redwood foundation, um, but you know, even redwood needs to be cleaned. Uh, we have clear fir. You know thresholds and, and door frames and window frames and things like that that need to be preserved and things like that and so um, rightly so in the creation of the foundation it was to emphasize the artist experience the residency and so the funds that supported that through the sales of what was left uh, to Robert Yarber in creating the foundation of, of Gray's paintings went to support that. And in its early days, for three weeks, all you had to do was get there, turn off your cell phone, don't ask for a newspaper or listen to the radio or want to know what's on the evening news, and they would feed you. Morning, noon, evening, sumptuous meals, and you just had to be there. And unfortunately, that doesn't exist now. And uh, you get one meal now. You get dinner. <laughs> and 
but it's still a special place. And so we're now actively trying to figure out ways to support the preservation of the lake, as well as continuing to, to make accessible the residencies and to somewhat expand the accessibility to the site itself for people who are not residents. So, yes. Two questions. What occasioned the moves from one location to another? And were there financial considerations, or did you just get tired and wanted to move elsewhere? Well, at the Rock, the place just got too small. And so as he was painting these extraordinary paintings that were soon in exhibits in, in New York and at the Whitney and Washington, D.C. and places like that, um, he could no longer paint on the floor. He needed more space. So he just outgrew the rock. And, uh, uh, but you know, because of the sales of paintings not only to the Museum of Modern Art, but those other institutions, Detroit and Philadelphia, um, you know, the Phillips and things like that, he was able to look for another site when he built Carolodden. He had to leave Carolodden because the, the development and, and what was building around them in terms of, of the greater Tacoma, Seattle metro area, and Boeing aircraft uh, were driving him crazy. And that at Woodtown, at Woodtown, he was probably his most engaging in terms of being open to visitors. Families and friends were moving, I mean, were coming to visit Graves time and time again. Uh, he got a little tired of that after a while, but then he also got homesick. Uh, he decided that he couldn't be Irish. And um, so he comes back to create the lake. Yes. I want to ask you about the aesthetics of the house, the lake house. I've Which house? The, the lake house. Okay. I've seen pictures of it where there's something called the long room that fronts out onto the lake. And it appears like there's a series of windows that are all identical. Identical spacing, identical mullions. I, and, and it seems like it lacks kind of a complex rhythm that you'd expect from somebody like Morris Gray, something that interrupted that, that added more. Does it seem less boring and repetitious inside the room than it looks from the outside? You know, it, it doesn't seem repetitious because of what you're able to experience with that vista looking out through those windows. And so, I mean, he was, I mean, so, you know, think about the, the design of the timbers in the portico at Woodway. I mean, there's specific spacing in those columns and porticos. And so it's not, it wasn't surprising to me to see that he would do that with, with windows. And then, but the, the, the proportions in this, and the dimensions of each of the rooms adjacent to Adjacent to the great room, with all the windows giving you the broadest vista, is a smaller room. Uh, and it's like a sitting room. And it's, it's square. And it has its own door um, facing south that you could go to and you could go to on the, on, to the walkway and walk around the perimeter facing the lake shore. And then, on the other side of the great room, there, there are some elevation changes once you get to the kitchen. The kitchen is one of my favorite spaces at the lake. It's a, it's a country kitchen. It's huge. It has a wonderful fireplace. It overlooks a very well, literally designed raised garden and, and hedges. And uh, it's one of my favorite spaces. And, um, but it's, it's more of an interior sense. And then the room he built for himself, the main room, um, it's very small, it's very modest. It has its own little wood stove, and it has a door out to the walkway. And so each room has kind of its own experience. Are the interior walls plastered, or are they wood? Is the interior walls in the house, are they wood? They're cedar. Cedar? cedar? Yeah, they're cedar, cedar and, and wood. Um, as you walk in the entryway, um, 
uh, they're papered with, with Japanese papers and lacquered papers and, and uh, at least you know, from time to time they are. And they almost look like, look like cork. Uh, interesting enough, the, the house at Woodway, Caroladen, are also cedar. And when we were visited, the, the present owners at that time were researching the finish. They thought the cedar panel had been washed uh, with some sort of white uh, medium. And, and uh, as it turns out, uh, they were burnished with beeswax. Grays love beeswax. And if he found something to, to use it on, including paintings, he would just work it in. And they decide not to go through and re, you know, burnish all the, all the cedar interior walls with beeswax. Yes? Insight into how Graves started his collaboration with Ibsen Nelson? Ibsen Nelson? Yes. Um, this is hard to document. So, the relationship between Ibsen Nelson, a Seattle architect, uh, and Graves, and when I read uh, both letters from Ibsen as well as, as from Morris, uh, is Graves walking through downtown Seattle, and I believe it's a, either a YMCA or YWAC that, that Nelson had designed. And he saw that design and he said, I like that, that speaks to me. And uh, so that's how it began. Um, and you could, um, I, I visited, um, I didn't know Ibsen Nelson, never got to meet him, but I was able to go to the house he designed for himself on Vashon Island, and um, you know, it's a Scandinavian U-shaped uh, farmhouse. And again, has this, some of the same sensibilities of what he and Grace created for the lake. One last question. <laughs> the last question? <laughs> What created the lake? How, how the lake was formed 200 some years ago. I don't know how the lake was formed <laughs> 200 years ago. <laughs> well, I, thought, I thought it was from a uh, 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 volcano. There's a landslide. Yeah. There's a landslide. There was a swamp up on the hill and it kind of moved down and started catching water. Mm -hmm. because Very unstable. My impression and, uh, and from the visitor's uh, comment was when we, you know, drove uh, on that really narrow road mm -hmm. and we went to the lake, you know, we're going up and up, and when we parked the car, one of the visitors asked, where's the lake? Right. And then we walk, you know, three, maybe just three feet away right. from the parking spot. It was the lake. <laughs> And I also would like to comment on those windows that Larry mentioned. Um, when I'm walking, I feel it's the blending of eastern and western. And those windows just feels like um, a shoji screen. And every window you look out, it's, it's still life, and it's landscape. And you can stand in front of one window, or you can check it all in, and there it was. And then you look at it back in this, you know, uh, storage area. Mm -hmm. This is all. You don't know it's storage. Area. Right. It is a, it's a cedar or fir. Or cedar. Cedar. It just, it's so minimal. And you stand there, you know what you want. And I think that's what he he had that vision and why we argue so strongly with the architect. He had to expense everything to put a house right on the edge of the lake. Well, it, right, and it, it's like the one of Doggo Island. It's, it's like the rock also. The fact that he would decide that he wasn't. He wasn't going to build a house 
unless it was overhanging the cliff. And uh, it was the same to Lake. And uh, he, was, he was distinctive, he was inspired. And, and I guess it's because we have so many works by him in the collection that it was really refreshing to begin to learn, and I am just beginning to learn, about um, his ideas, his concepts for design, and, and these, these magnificent structures he created uh, to both live and create and, and to share. So uh, the foundation has recently entered uh, the present, and so we do have somewhat of an interactive website. And uh, it's just Morris Gray's foundation. And you can learn more about the residency uh, there. But um, really, I think out of respect and, and, and of the place, but also in memory of Gray's, uh, the foundation is a very, very quiet, private entity. But very excited to share with, with you and, and those who seek that kind of of existence or reality. So thank you again for coming.